So there we go. What is balance? All right, a balance center of mass. We're going to get into the science. We're going to talk about the brain. We're going to talk about the feet. We're going to talk about some of the good stuff so that way you can understand the battle we're facing. Thank you. And so what is balance? Well, here's an experiment you can do. When you go home, I want you to find a wall. I want you to put your back against the wall. And what I want you to do is I want you to try to bend over and touch your toes. Now, eventually, I get to a point where I fall. Well, what happens? Well, my balance center of mass, because my rear end, my back is against the wall, it cannot adjust. Sometimes our muscles, our structure, we have injuries, our bones will not let us, allow us to adjust. If I step away from the wall and I go down, you see how my bottom goes out? It's making adjustment. My brain is calculating where I need to be in order to get down and touch my toes. It's keeping my balance center of mass in such a place that I am able to do that. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about balance center of mass, where your body needs to adjust in order for you to maintain that position. So let's check your balance center of mass. What I'd like to do is have you guys stand and move behind your chair, or I can bring a chair to you in the front if you would like make life a little easier. So this strapping young lad here is my uh, middle son. And so you can see him on one foot. It doesn't matter how old you are, what age you are, balance is the basis of movement. It's the basis of life, right? If you can't balance, things go south pretty quickly. We'll talk a little bit more. What I'd like to do, right, these are our assessments here. You're going to start with your feet hip width apart. I want you to bend your knees a little bit. All right, you're going to pull your belly button in, hands on the chair, that's it. And now what I want you to do with your hands on the chair, I want you to close your eyes and hold this position for 15 seconds. If you don't feel comfortable or confident, open your eyes. That's it. If you feel comfortable or confident, go ahead and raise your hands up just an inch. Just gently raise. Hold them there above the chair. That's it. In five, four. Three, two, one, eyes open. Some of you may have noticed a little bit of change, a little bit of swaying, and found it a little bit harder to find your balance center of mass to keep yourself positioned. Some, maybe not, that's okay. Just means you're really good. Now what we're gonna do is take those feet and move them as close together as we can. We're gonna go through the same song and dance, right? So what I would like you to have you do is put your hand on the back of the chair. You're gonna close your eyes. I want you to get your bearings. Now, if you do not feel comfortable or confident, don't lift your hands off the chair. All right, 15 seconds starts now. If you feel confident, you may raise your hands up just an inch or so. Only if you feel safe. I want everyone to be safe. Good. And five, four, three, two, one, and time. Well done. A little more unstable. Well, what happened? Well. The amount of space and area we covered decreased, right? We're going to get to that. Signal's coming from the bottom of our foot. Now, here, you're just going to stand on one foot. So what I'll have is, if we can, let's have everyone, we'll just face our chair. And what I'd like you to do is you're just going to sh gently shift your weight to your left foot. You're going to lift your right foot up into the air. Hold on to the back of that chair. That's it. All right, get your bearings. If you feel comfortable and confident, I want you to raise your right hand off that chair. Only if you feel comfortable and confident. Right hand. Right hand. Yes, sir. Just your right hand. Left hand is still in contact. This will give you a good indication of whether you feel good enough, well enough to lift both hands off the chair. And we'll hold that position. You've got your foot there if you need it. You have that chair there if you need it. And three, two, one, and relax. Good, good. We're going to go through the same process, but on the other side, right? So now we're going to shift our weight to our left foot. We'll bring our right foot up into the air. Did we do that? Let's go. I do that at soccer all the time. The kids always have to remind me. Let's go to the right foot. Excuse me. Shift your weight to the right foot. All right. We're going to bring our left foot up into the air. You, got your, you have your hands on the chair. Get your bearings. Good. If you feel comfortable, let's lift your left hand off the chair. This will give you a good indication. If you feel comfortable and confident, go ahead and lift your right hand as well. Good. You 
Use that hand, use, those, use that foot if you have to put it down, good. And three, two, one, and tie, good. Go ahead and have a seat for me. So in class, we will be doing that next week. We're gonna do that and then we're gonna close our eyes and stand on one foot. So, why is that so hard? Why is it closing my eyes is so hard to do? Well, it's because of our vestibular system, all right? There's a lot of systems at play when it comes to balance, your eyes and ears. How many of you get your eyes and ears checked once a year? I strongly recommend you do that. There are inner tubes, inner semicircular tubules in our ears. You know anybody that's ever had vertigo? Maybe one of you have had vertigo? It's awful. But what happens is, is this fluid helps orient our bodies as to where we are in, in a relationship to the world. Where we are, as far as our bodies, are we vertical, are we horizontal? This fluid, if it gets these crystals in our ears, if they get out of whack, can raise havoc on our balance because it changes how our body is being oriented. We have a main nerve that goes from these tubules from our inner ear to our brain. We have also another main nerve that runs from our eyes to our brain. How many of you have been on a boat? You get motion sickness? Well, what happens? Well, what happens is, is your eyes are looking on the horizon and it's flat, right? You may be going up and down, but you're, and your eyes are sending signals to the brain going, yeah, no, we're flat, we're, we're completely you know, we're completely vertical, where everything's good. However, the waves are hitting you and you're moving side to side, so you're getting a different type of signal from the ears. Saying, oh, no, no, we're not stable. We're kind of all over the place. We're left, we're right, we're on the frontal, we're on the side, we're on, the, on every plane possible. So then when you start getting those mixed signals, you get motion sickness. So we'll talk about a little bit about that. We also have mechanoreceptors on the bottom of our feet that detect pressure, right? If I go too far forward before I get past the point of no return, all that pressure is sending signals to my brain. The brain says, hey, move back. I move back, right? But how good is that communication network? What if I have a neurological disease? What if I have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's? How does that impact my balance? We'll talk about that. And then, at the end of the day, we're talking about proprioceptors, right? They go right along with mechanoreceptors. Phantom leg pain, phantom arm pain. If you've ever known anyone that's had any type of amputation, they complain about still having pain in the limb that has been amputated. What that is is a strong indication and that's strong evidence of what we call proprioceptors. Little nerve endings all over our body that help us orient, help the brain orient where we are in space and time in the world, on the planet. So you can see how a lot of systems have to work correctly in order for, to make your balance operate, right? It's not as easy or simple as you think. And then oftentimes I explain it like this. How many people go to the cardiologist? How many people go to the dentist? How many folks go get an annual checkup? Your balance is that important to keep an eye on, especially as we age, right? So can you balance on one foot for 15 seconds? I had a booth at a health fair. No one stopped by. So I moved behind the booth. My wife went out front. There was a couple of older gentlemen that stopped by, but I don't think they were interested in balance. <laughs> so she has her scrubs on and all that good stuff. So she said, hey, what we need to do is we need to make a sign because what we have found is most people do not realize their balance is bad or poor until they fall. So we created, this is the sign that I put on my table and that's it. There's nothing else on my table. And I cannot tell you how many people over the years I've had walk up and go, oh, I can do that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And then they start putting their bags down but then they quickly realize, oh my goodness, can't do that. This is your benchmark. This is your benchmark, right? Outside of actual gait pattern issues, if you can stand on one leg for 15 seconds, your, your risks for falls are reduced greatly. All right, we're going to talk about the impacts of falls, not only physically, but financially too, especially bigger picture in the United States and how much that's cost in this country. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So, this is my youngest son, and this is the client I was telling you about that uh, was the impetus for Balance University. This is Mr. Wolf. He's a World War II veteran. 
For all our veterans today, if you know or have anyone, my son is in the Air Force currently and uh, December 7th, I believe it was 1944, is when Pearl Harbor was bombed. So I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, a, a veteran that was there at Pearl Harbor, quite the story, quite the story. Mr. Wolf was uh, one of the um, officers on a destroyer in the Pacific and then became captain of a minesweeper. Anyone want to guess what a minesweeper is made out of? Wood. Does anyone have any idea how unstable a wooden ship is in the Pacific versus a metal ship, an iron ship? <laughs> so you make these minesweepers out of wood because the mines are not attracted to the wood. And they can navigate a path through, right? They would go through, they would navigate, and then they would take off another, you know, few miles, and then they would take off another few miles. Is how they did it. He told this great story about how all these sailors who had previously been in combat or battle and, and were wounded, but still had a little time left in the military, and they were looking for easy time, right? So they would get on his ship, and it was so bad that these seasoned sailors were getting seasick. And they would put in papers to go back to the ships they came from. <laughs> so, so these two are exactly 90 years apart. At the time of this picture, Mr. Wolf was 95 and Caleb was five years old. My son now is, is well, he will be 15, believe it or not, on Christmas Day. They both were born on Christmas Day. Mr. Wolf. Uh, that's correct. Is he still alive? No, sir, he's not. And so this is what happened. Caleb was in preschool, and sometimes he would have to go to work with me, right? We had a little time between the babysitter to be available. This was the session he had to attend. He was sitting down one day on his iPad. He's very quiet. He was a very quiet kid. And I told Mr. Wolf we were going to do 12 repetitions. 12 repetitions do not always mean 12. It may mean 15. It may mean 20. I'm just going to tell you 12 to give you a point to aim for. Right? If I think we need to do more, we'll do more. On that day, I thought we needed to do more. However, unbeknownst to me, Caleb was counting. And he told Mr. Wolf, he said, uh, hey, Mr. Wolf, Dad, that's, uh, that's 12. He's done, right? And so Mr. Wolf said, son, come sit over here by me. And a friendship was born. And so for the next year and a half, as Caleb moved through uh, preschool and then kindergarten, those two became really good friends. Mr. Wolf, I got a phone call from a caregiver. A lot of people do this, and let this be just kind of uh, some advice not to do this. You know the toilet paper roll? He was trying to get up off the toilet. For whatever reason, the caregiver wasn't there. It could have been him. You know, it's just a lot of circumstances. He pushed on the toilet paper roll. It broke off, and he fell and was wedged in between the toilet. I generally work one-on-one -on -one sessions. I work with more of, or of the intense cases that we have. Uh, more than more complicated things with like nine vertebrae fracture, extreme Parkinson's or dementia. I got a phone call from his caregiver. He was next on my schedule. I was there within five minutes before the ambulance. And all we needed to do was really get him up. Once we got him up and assessed, he was hurt. Mr. Wolf was gone in about, about 18 months later. And what happened was it was a series of events from this fall that, that ended up in some fractures. So I went on a hunt because this was not the first time he had fallen, albeit it's not your typical fall you think of. What I found were the statistics were astonishing. And, and why we were not addressing this on a big grand scale blew me away. Could not fathom the cost, the cost on families, the impact on lives, and what I was seeing in homes with folks not having the leg strength to stand up. So I have been doing balance specifically we self-published this book in 2018. So we sold almost a thousand copies minus 2020 because we didn't do anything in that year. So we're on a good track right now, but I've been working specifically with seniors since 2011, so about 10 years. I've been doing what I do now since 2001, so about 20 years working with folks. So the vet, you notice how hard it was to stand Right? I mean, it may, it may be you were stable, but maybe a little unstable. Like it wasn't maybe, maybe it was difficult, maybe it was a little easy, but nonetheless, it was an effort. This right here is called the dynadisc. Let's talk about the brain in terms of balance. How many signals do you think need to go from my brain to my foot to keep me on one foot? What 
what kind of action do you think needs to happen for me to go down, touch my toe, and come back up? Lots. We did an experiment. We took these diamond discs, and I had my wife, my mom, and my kids. What I found was the older you get, the worse your balance gets. Well, why is that? I mean, there was real evidence there. My kids, psh, Caleb flew through it. Flew through it. Oh, that's a video of him on the Dyna disc just going up and down. And he's about 10, 11 years old. So then the older kids got on it. They were pretty efficient. I got on it at, at, in, in my 30s and was fairly efficient. And my mom got on it. She really struggled, right? My dad didn't want anything to do with it. Senior Master Sergeant Williams wasn't having nothing to do with it. You know, and I still have to call him that sometimes. Not so much anymore. But, but, but it was real evidence. So what's happening? As we age, our brains, they, our bodies, they deteriorate. It's part of life. But we're in our brain. Our synapses in our brains get further apart. Right? So what happens if you have Parkinson's or dementia? We're not going to get off in the weeds too far here. But you know neurotransmitters? Have you ever heard that term? Serotonin, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, right? Think of those as trains. Right? And trains go from train station to train station. Neurons are the train stations, okay? We're not gonna get too far, just trust me, follow me here. We're not gonna get too far off in the weeds. Here's the thing, as we age, train stations get further apart, and it takes a little longer for the train to get there, right? And sometimes, with certain neurological diseases, the train station just disappears altogether, or the, neurotrans or the neurotransmitter, the train derails. There's research that shows us with exercise, we can recreate and re, the brain is malleable. We can restructure the brain. We can bring those neurons back together. That research was done in 1945. We're gonna talk about that too. So we have a bed at our house, a standing bed. Still to this day, kids come in, Mr. Williams, I'm ready. We'll bring out the dining disc, you know, I have four children. Uh, three of them are, are in, uh, well, my daughter is very proud, graduated, she's, uh, she's a nurse, she'll be a nurse. She'll have her bachelor's in nursing next week, very proud. So anyway, we, we have kids and they come in and you get $5 if you can stand on a dining disc and go down, touch your toe and come back up. Out of all these years, I've given away $15. 10 of it has gone to the same person. Okay, he's not allowed to do this anymore. <laughs> so that's him doing it. So again, problems, guys. These are our problems and I want to hammer these home. Neuromuscular efficiency and proprioception, right? This is dealing with the mechanoreceptors and the proprioceptors, all right? This is dealing with how our brain communicates with our body. Proprioception is just the sense I'm stable, but I'm unstable. You may hear it as a proprioceptively enriched environment, right? I'm stable here, but I'm a little unstable. Two, the vestibular system. That's something we have to address. We address one, we address two, and then finally we address three, leg strength. Balance will fall into place. Neuromuscular efficiency. How well does our brain communicate with our muscles? Think about these two guys. Brett Favre, cowboy killer. I'm telling you, that guy. Him and Aaron Rodgers. Tim Tebow, fantastic athlete, right? Look at their arms. You see how his arm, you see the height of his arm here? You see how high it is as compared to Mr. Tebow's? How many times do you think he's thrown a football? Thousands. Thousands. Maybe hundreds of thousands. How many times? Same for Mr. Tebow. So do you think when he gets ready to throw a football, he stands back and he goes, okay, arm up, 90 degrees. Okay, he's moving at 12 miles an hour. I'm going to have to change to 87 degrees. Or do you just think he drops back and goes, he's open, throw the ball. How many, how many times does it take for the office staff in the brain go, yeah, we're throwing it, Boop, hit the switch, and it just happens. That's the same process that happens when we walk and talk. We just do it, right? Same thing when these guys throw the ball, they just do it. Tim Tebow didn't make it in the NFL. You see where his arm is as compared to Aaron Rodgers? And in the NFL, you're successful in a matter of milliseconds or inches. Brett Favre would throw the ball like this. It's gone in two point whatever seconds, maybe one second. Tim Tebow throws the ball and it's going in 1.4. It's too long. Defenders would get there and knock the pass down. 
That's how he ended up out in the NFL and playing baseball because his motion was so long. In fact, research tells us that Mr. Tebow would have to throw the ball the correct way as many times as he's thrown the ball the incorrect way in order to correct his form. That's how impactful that neuromuscular efficiency is, such as learning a French word, right? Or a salsa step. <laughs> Whenever we start to learn a word, a language, or a skill, we have uh, uh, neurons in our brains, we have cells in our brains that start to uh, congregate and accumulate and gather together, and they start to form a thought, right? So what happens is, is the more you say this French word, the more cells congregate, and the more permanent and the more easier it is to find that thought, that word, right? Exercise gives us BDNF, and we're going to talk more about this. BDNF is infrastructure. I'm not going to flood you. Neurotransmitters need that BDNF. Neurons need that BDNF to build those train stations. That's why we had such a strong infrastructure on that wrong, on that wrong system. He would have to do it as many times the right way. This matters to us for balance, because how long have we gone not addressing our balance? Or how bad is our balance? Have we fallen once in the last year? Twice? Four times? If you've fallen four times and haven't hurt yourself significantly, consider yourself extremely lucky, extremely fortunate. Proprioception, again, stable but unstable. And if you notice, I'm on the floor, a very stable, hard surface here. Here, I'm on an Eric's pad. It's like a pillow, right? Think about standing on a pillow. It's, it's a little more unstable than the floor. And this is a half foam book, right? Think about the circumference of a circle, and it extends about three feet, and you just cut it in half. You put the flat part on the floor, and you stand on it, right? So each phase, phase one, phase two, phase three, gets a little bit harder. The proprioceptive environment gets a little more challenging. Does that make sense? In Balance University, that's what we're doing because now when we do those type of exercises, think about the communication going on in the brain. If I can stand on one foot on the ground, progress to the Eric's pad, if I need to progress to the half foam roll, walking, turning, walking backwards should be a bit easier. Does that make sense? We exaggerate those positions. Neuropathy is something that definitely impacts those signals. Neuropathy, we have damaged nerve endings in our lower legs, sometimes our arms and hands, but it certainly impacts the signals to our brain. So that's one thing we have to look out for. More than 3 million US cases per year, new cases. These are new cases. What do you think? Is it better to practice your balance barefooted or with shoes on? Who knows? Barefoot. Yeah, barefoot. Barefoot. And the reason why, that's right. So as we get older and we move through the corporate ladder and you know we get the kids move on and now all of a sudden we can keep all that money to ourselves and <laughs> Our feet hurt so bad, now we can go buy those $5,000 orthotics in our shoes and they feel oh so good. But what happens with orthotics is they mask dysfunction. If I have a little bit of eversion, eversion, right? Let's say if my, if my toe comes in, my toe wings out. A lot of these orthotics mask dysfunction. So what happens is the mechanoreceptors at the bottom of my feet responsible for telling me where my feet are on the ground. When I have these big, thick soles that interrupt those signals between the floor and the ground, it creates problems when it comes to calculating my balance center of mass. Does that make sense? Because I almost have two versions of my balance, one with shoes off and one with shoes on. Does that make sense? Now, if you, balance, if you practice your balance with your shoes on, that's okay. You just wanna make sure that you have a good pair of flat bottom shoes. So, any questions so far? Good, good deal. Vestibular system. Eyes. This cochlea uh, here is the third part. This middle ear right here is what we're talking about. The semicircular canals. This is what contains 
that fluid that's going to help orient us with the world, right? This is a huge part of our balance. 69 million people in the U.S. have suffered from vertigo at some point. The National Institute of Death is another communication disorder. That's a lot. That is a lot. Life indicators. Rule number one. How strong are your legs? Strength is the beginning of all of this. Okay? So, I want everyone to stand for me. We're just going to stand in the front of our chair. What I want to do is we're going to do an eccentric quad activity. Everybody knows what that is, right? Okay. We're going to sit down in slow motion, right? We all have seen this. I call that the plop. <laughs> this is a no plop zone. All right, nice and tall. We're gonna sit down very slow. You can use your hands to guide you if you feel a bit uncomfortable. That gives you a little more confidence as we sit. I like to put my hands here or on my hips. You'll see me do that in class and we have classes available on the site that have been pre-recorded. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna take four seconds to sit down, okay? You ready? Here we go, all together. Four, three, lower two, one, and we're down. Wonderful. Good. Nine more. Here we go. We'll do a couple more. Nice and slow. Remember, get your nose over your toes. Stick your bottom way out there, okay? And let's descend. Four, three, shift your weight to your heels. Two, one. Good. And again, we're going to do two more. Make sure your knees fall to your toes. Don't let your knees cave in. Here we go. Four, three. Two and a half, two and one. <laughs> Good. And we're up. I wasn't down no more. Yeah, did you? Yeah, you were there. You're doing great. Here we go. 99, 98, just kidding. Two, hold. One. Perfect. One of the biggest issues I see, and I'm going to tell you right now, someone who is having difficulties with balance typically, the majority of the time, have little leg strength, right? One of the red flags that I see is when I walk into someone's home and I meet them for the first time. Do they get up and meet me at the front door? When I walk in, do they stand up and greet me? Or do they sit down and say, hey, Chris, come over here and sit down. If you can't stand for 30 seconds, how are you going to move? How are you going to exercise your heart, right? I mean, when you walk your dog outside, what's one of the first things the dog does? Go to the bathroom. So three things here. Walk on a treadmill, you need strong legs. It exercises our heart. It's literally called cardiovascular exercise. You cannot do it if you do not have strong legs. The other thing, as we age, what ends up, no one tells us about the incognizance of life as we age. What ends up happening, if we have strong legs, the longer we can stay standing, blood circulates more standing, walking than it does sitting, being in one location. So it acts as lubrication so everything is able to move out. And I'll leave that one at that. The other thing along that goes with the cardiovascular exercise is what it does to our brain. Remember the BDNF and the infrastructure? It has science, research has shown us exercise can keep the brain young by creating the BDNF, by creating a malleable brain. We need a malleable brain so that the train stations can stay closer together. So what you're starting to see is you're starting to see a pattern of issues, and we're gonna check off the issues, okay? I'm dealing with that, okay? I, I, I'm good here with the exercise. I'm good here with the vestibular system. I'm good here with the leg strength. You see, you see where we're going with this? It's, a, it's kind of a three, four pronged attack. These are my life indicators. This is what I consider to be the utmost importance. I'll tell you right now, it's not a pleasant topic, but hey, we're talking about facts and truth here. If I see someone that's not moving around, they're sitting more than they're standing, chances are they're not gonna be around very long. I see people that will sit probably 14 hours out of the 15 hours they're awake. That's not conducive to a long life. VO2 max, 
is how much our heart can stand and still get back to a resting normal heart rate, right? It's a stress test. Heart's a pump, pumps blood all over the body. The stronger your heart, blood fly down. The weaker the heart, the more the heart has to pump to get blood to the extremities. A good heart rate, resting heart rate, just like what you guys are doing now, resting, at rest, for women, 70 beats per minute. Uh, 75, I'm sorry. Women is 75, men, 70 beats per minute. Anyone want to guess Lance Armstrong's resting heart rate when he was winning all those Tour de France's? Yes, I know Lance Armstrong, but 38. His heart was beating thirty every thirty-eight every minute. It only beat thirty-eight times. Boom, boom. Yeah, pretty incredible. Then we found out he was doing what's called blood doping, which is taking out his own blood, putting it in centrifuges, spinning it for about ten minutes, and then injecting it back into himself because the centrifuge, the spinning, infuses oxygen O2 into the blood. And so when he put the blood, his blood oxygen level was so high. And of course, we know that. Exercise requires oxygenated blood. So he had a lot more of it than most people. That's what, what he was doing. And the ability to build lean muscle tissue. And of course, as we get older, men, we start losing testosterone at the age of 30. Women, you guys, you do have testosterone in your bodies. You start to lose that as well, just not at the rate that men do. So these are all life indicators. Leg strength is number one by far. Any questions? We're good. So I have a new presentation I just put it together last night. This is uh, it's okay. Yeah, that's all right. There's another slide that I just put in last night. So again, I told you that it's been a couple years. But so how do I improve my balance? So we were going to talk about his BDNF, right? That's why I always come prepared. So back to this BDNF. I'll make it real simple. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, right? But I do want to make sure that you understand the importance of, of moving. Exercise is not going to a gym. It can be, but exercise is going for a walk. It's going to the end of the mailbox a few times a day, right? In, 1990, in 1945, a Dr. Hebs from Quebec discovered evidence of the brain being malleable. This was determined as a novel event. What he did was he had a group of mice. These mice, in 1945, you can imagine the lab restrictions were not quite what they are today, right? We're probably quite a lot more restricted now, right? So back in the day, he had these three groups of mice. And so what he did was he took one of them, he was leaving one day, he said, hey, I'm going to take this group of mice home. Yes, I know they're in this study, but my kids will want to play with them. I mean, it'll keep them busy for hours. So he takes them home. He takes them home. The kids play with them. They come back. And yes, you're right. The other scientists were blown away with what he did because he just ruined the entire experiment. But what he found, what they decided to do, they said, okay, continue to do that. We'll just add that little playing that you're doing, the bringing home, we'll call that socialization. So now these particular group of mice were socializing as well as exercising on their little wheel. At the end of the experiment, what they found is that the brains of these mice had gotten bigger. They had grown. That's our proof that the BDNF, blah, 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 makes the impact. That's why the exercise is so important to the balance. So, and what they did was they called it a novel event. So in 1995, we had a guy connect the BND, BDNF to exercise. And in 2007, this is what matters. This is the meat. You hung in there. You've done good. <laughs> German researchers found that people learned vocabulary words 20% faster following exercise than they did before exercise. 20% faster. There's more proof in Naperville, Indiana with a group of kids. These kids were uh, not scoring very well. It was not in a very well-to-do neighborhood. Uh, this study was done in a national level at the end of the day. These Naperville students finished sixth in math and first in the world in science. And what they did was they had these kids exercise in the morning before school, and then they went to school. So what this means for us is that in Balance University, the pillar comes last. The reason for that is, is we work on our strength, right? The sitting slow. We work on our posture. We work on our flexibility and 
then we move to the balance pillar. Because now we have taken that exercise, and now that our brain is primed and ready, now we can start implementing and coding the brain, positioning ourselves in proprioceptive environments, and we're more adept to learn. Does that make sense? You guys buy that? I just made it up. Now that's a lot, I know, and I understand it might not be what you came for, but you have to understand that balance, this is something, this lecture has changed many, many, many times. And the reason that it's continued to change is because of the research that we continue to find and go through. So how do you improve your balance? Four pillars of balance. Strength. Just like the exercise that we just did, the sitting slow, is single-handedly one of the best exercises that you can do to build your strength. How many of you woke up this morning? Fantastic. We're on a roll. You should do that. If you do that, sit slow, every day of your life when you sit down, you will be amazed at the strength you can build in your legs. Right? Here's another exercise you can do for your strength to build your legs. It's easy. How many of you watch TV every day? When you watch TV, the cushier the chair, the better. It means it's hard. It's harder. This exercise, sit up nice and tall. You're going to hold on. You're just going to extend your legs out in front of you, pull your toes back, core tight, and then down. Good. And we'll go for two. That's it. And three. Now watch this. Let's go up and out, in and down. Up, out, in and down. Good. Up, out, in and down. Now take your hands over your head. Thumbs together. Up, out. In and down. That's it. Three more. Up, out, in, and down. Two more. In. Good. Last one. And relax. That's what I call getting 100 pennies on the dollar. We're working the shoulders. We're working the arms. We're working the core. We're working the quads. We're working the hips. We're working the glutes. We're working everything. Getting 100 pennies on the dollar. Getting a lot of value. Right? That's what I try to do. That's what we try to do in the class. That's an example of a strengthening exercise. Now, from strength, we move to posture. I'm gonna have you stand if you don't mind. You don't have to, but go ahead and stand. How many of you love to plank? You know the plank? Yeah, you know, most people get like this. Okay, that's the worst exercise ever. It's really good for you, but I don't like getting down on the ground. So I played football for a long time, so getting on the ground is I don't do that anymore. <laughs> what I want you to do, if you can, if you don't have any restrictions in the shoulders, our feet are gonna be a little wider than our hips. This exercise is for your posture, for your core. If you have any back pain, any weakness in the core, this is the second best next to a plank. We're gonna take the hands over our head. And what I wanna do, I want you to watch me first. I'm gonna stick my bottom out and I'm just gonna sink. Now, as I get down into this position here, I'm not going any further. I'm gonna push my hands back. I'm gonna hold three, two, one, and I'm coming up, okay? Everyone together. We're gonna to sink down, stick your bottom out, shift your weight to your heel, Push your arms back, three, two, one, and up. Good, good. And again, bottom out, that's it. Push those hands back as far as you can take them. Three, two, one, and up, two more. And down, core tight, push back, three, two, one, and up, one more time. And down, push back, Three, two, one, and relax. Have a seat. You feel that working? Did you really feel it? Did you work on that? Absolutely. Okay. Every time. Still. Still. I do this. I teach a class online for FGCU on Fridays, and we do this almost every class. If you go to the website, go to the YouTube channel, go to class. I have a playlist that has our classes for free. FGCU hadn't found out about it yet. <laughs> they should, they, no, it'll be fine. PBS? No, sir. It's Florida Gulf Coast University, uh, FGCU. Oh. And so what I did is I take my classes. We have an agreement. And so I take my classes. I teach through their university, through their portal. They have a continuing education department. And so I've been teaching there for maybe three or four years, teaching balanced university classes. And so if you, if you go look at one of our classes, watch one of our classes, you can see us doing this exercise. Fantastic exercise. Another one, just stay where you're at. You're gonna bring your hands up in front of you. Palms to your sky. Uh, to your, uh, be careful, because we're gonna be going out to the side. I know you're probably slapping at home, but just don't hit anything. Yeah. 
<laughs> nice and tall, and we're just going to simply open up. Now, as you open up, I want you to push back. Stretch your chest, and together. Touch your pinkies, and again. Good, good. You want to be careful. Don't, let, don't allow your head to jump forward. Keep your ears by your shoulders. That's it. Push. Great. And together. Nice and smooth. Push. And together. That's it. Five. Good. And four. Push. Stretch that chest. Good. Three. That's it. And two. And one. And relax. And rest. You feel your shoulders? So what we're doing is we're building these muscles in the posterior part of the shoulder, right? Everything is in front of us. When we drive, we get on our cell phones. In fact, we're having a big issue now. What we're seeing, especially, in the, it started in the younger generation. Now we're seeing it throughout all age groups. We're losing the lordotic curve in the spine, in the, spine, in the, in the cervical spine. You know how the spine, it comes in and goes down and then tucks under? We're losing that curve. You know why? So when you look at your cell phone, I'm going to look at it up here, right? And so it started out with the younger, the younger kids, but now we're seeing it in all age groups. Just people looking at their phones, right? These posture exercises are extremely important because as we drive and work on our cell phones, what happens to my shoulders? They go full. All this tightens up. Now think about the years and years and years we've been doing these things. Sitting, right? And so now you see it in a lot of young people. I can't stand it. It drives me nuts. A lot of young people. My kids know better. I mean, I've, I've almost, well, I've done things because they're, now over years and years and years, that type of posture will change your balance center of mass. Because this goes to this. Right? Now, there are other issues going on, but that is a contributing factor. So we want to win the battles that we can win. Strengthen the shoulders. We build muscle, right? You felt your shoulders burning? We're building muscle back there. Those, the posterior deltaries, major minor, are getting stronger. Building muscle tissue. How many have heard muscles heavier than fat? So that muscle acts as an anchor and pulls the shoulders back. Does that make sense? So then not only that, but as we push back, we're dynamically stretching the chest. Those muscles there. So we're, we're killing two birds with one stone. We're stretching, increasing the elasticity in the muscles here, and we're strengthening the shoulders in the back. So that way, when I walk, my balance center of mass is where it's supposed to be. If my balance center of mass changes because of dysfunction, you're going to get pain. Pain is a product of dysfunction in the body somewhere. But what ends up happening is if a muscle cannot function through its full range of motion, another muscle has to make up for it. So if I'm here, which means my posterior delts, that upper back, all those muscles in my upper back are not functioning the way they're supposed to. They're supposed to help pull my shoulders back. Now, what muscle is going to have to work harder? My lower back. That's right. My core and my legs. Now my legs are going to have to catch me all the time. Does that make sense? You guys about that? That's why posture is extremely important in balance. So then we move to flexibility. How many of you have seen this? Right? Think about how tight these muscles are in the back. Just like the shoulders here. You need full range of motion or access to full range of motion in the hamstrings and the glutes and all those muscles, the posterior tib, the gastroc, so that you can reach full gate depth. Because if these muscles are tight, it will restrict you. So how do those muscles get tight? Let me show you. <laughs> Right? And, and as we get older, as we move through the corporate ladder, we sit more, right? Especially as we retire. Even though we have busy, active lives, it's a cumulative effect. Any questions there so far? Everybody buy it? I'm making it up as I go. Yes, sir. Did you, have you ever worked with glasses? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I have a, two clients at the moment currently, one I've had for six years, who's a golfer, golfs all over the world. And we do specific movements that balance and golf go hand in hand. 
what you're alluding to is balance is intertwined in everything, especially sports. You have to be balanced in sports. But more so even the posture, it's the flexibility in golf. That's where the nugget's at. And it's the ability to rotate at the hips, not being restricted, and being able to have full range of motion and have a lot of elasticity in the arms and the core to be able to get that club head around and then build that speed. So that's what that's what we run into with golfers. And then I always tell them, go ahead. But you mentioned the cell phone thing and kids, well, I'm too old for that to be a problem, but I had a long, long career where I sat at a desk mm -hmm. and I, I had no pain, but I, I, I think I suffered the same thing because I was like this for so many years. One of the stretches, so we'll do a flexibility pillar. It's my favorite because we just sit and stretch, and it's simple. I have folks slide to the edge of your chairs for me. Now, be careful. Don't go too far because we're going to be bending over. I don't want that chair to tip on you. Just take your left foot out in front of you. It's okay if the knees bend. It's okay if the toe points forward, if the toe points up. You're going to take both hands and just slide down, and you'll feel it. You'll feel a stretch. Do, do your other leg. So, so one leg is at a 90, and the other leg straight out in front of you. There you go. And you feel that, that pull in the back of your leg? That's what we're after. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the thing. People tell me, Chris, I feel it in my calf. I feel it in the back of my knee, or I feel it in my hamstring. doesn't matter. As long as you feel it in the back of your leg, you are stretching the tightest muscle in that synergy, in that group of muscles that work together. And up. And then we'll just do the other side. And it may be different on this side. We'll just slide down. Someone was asking me or telling me earlier, I believe it was you, sir, that was saying that you're better on one side than the other. Yeah, and relax. So today, for the rest of the day, you guys, uh, we're running a little long. I'll wrap this up real quick. Uh, we have, um, I want you to notice people. I want you to observe. Okay, don't, don't be creepy about it. Don't be weird. I want you to observe, observe folks in casual conversation. Rarely do you see someone talk with their peer, their colleague, with both feet, equally uh, equally using, maintaining 50% of the body weight. Generally, most people talk like this, or like this. Now, how much of my body weight is on this foot? 70, 75? So if I were to give it the remaining 30, 25%, it's not much of a stretch, right? Think about how many times my brain, Tim Tebow, has had to function and all those muscles that contract in this dominoes, of, of this domino uh, effect here, this series of contractions in order to keep me in a comfortable position here. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't comfortable. What if I go the other way? Now we're talking about on some unfamiliar ground. And then you give it all of your body weight. I have Spoken to many physical therapists, many physicians, and they all agree that that is probably what it is. There's not a research study I have looked, or there hasn't been of late. You know, I'm, I'm constantly combing through research articles, but that is the reason. For your neck, I do this flexibility exercise because one of the biggest issues I run into is people are concerned about their balance. One, because they don't want to hurt. One in four adults will fall every year over the age of 65. One in four. Hip fractures, we just did this in class where I spoke about hip fractures, right? Women uh, are the, women bear two thirds of all hip fractures. And osteoporosis is a big culprit of that, right? So really want to pay attention to the DEXA scan scores. Another thing is people want to stay at home for the rest of their lives. They don't want to go into a different place. They don't want to go into a continuing care retirement community. They want to stay at home. Some folks, like my grandfather, that's where he wants to be. That's, that's fine. Yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, independence is the root of why all this is happening, right? Either people want to stay home and stay independent, or they want to stay at a CCRC because they can stay independent, right? You have that in-home care. One of the big, big contributing factors of staying independent is being able to drive. And I didn't know if you knew this, but if you drive in Naples, everyone's a retired NASCAR driver. It's insane. It's incredible. Or Formula One driver. So 
How do we increase our field of vision when we drive? That's very important whenever we're changing lanes, whenever we're trying to, to uh, operate a motor vehicle, right? So this is what I want you to do. You're gonna sit back in your chair a little bit, okay? Keep your back away from the chair. I want you to take your left hand and you're gonna reach under your chair and you're gonna hold the underside of the chair, all right? You may have to reach through, that's okay. You're gonna hold the underside of your chair. I want you to take your right hand across your stomach, okay? So imagine that your left hand is the anchor to a boat. I want you to lean away from the anchor. So you're gonna lean and look to the right. I like to hold the back. So you're gonna lean and look to the right. So you're gonna look up, look down, find the place you feel that stretch the most and just hold. Good. And relax. You feel that stretch? Some may feel it up in their ear and their shoulder. What that does is we're stretching our sternocleidomastoid, right? That's the neck muscle. By giving and stretching, by giving those flexibility exercises, we're increasing the elasticity, we're increasing the range of motion, and therefore increasing our field of vision. Important when we drive, important when we walk, especially at night, so we can navigate, right? Let's go the other way. I don't want you guys walking in circles. Got our right hand under, we're holding with our right hand this time. Holding with our right hand, left hand across our bellies. And now we're gonna lean and look to the left. And we'll look up. We'll look down and find the place you feel the stretch the most and just hold. Good. In five, four, three, two, one, and time. Good. And relax. So that's a good flexibility exercise we do in class that you can do every day. So last but not least is, of course, the balance. And the balance is a big thing. And we do many, many different exercises in balance, like our assessments that we have done earlier. When you come back to class on Thursday, we're going to blow you away with how many balance exercises. We have what's called a trace D. How many of you brush your teeth every day? Ah, uh, so you can do the trace D when you're brushing your teeth. There's a lot of things you can do with your time in a day, right? Consistency. The key to all of this is being consistent. You've got to be consistent. The balance position or the position of confidence, this has changed. It, it, again, this is the old PowerPoint. Sorry, sorry for that, guys. My apologies. It should be the balance position of confidence here. And basically, that's going to be our balance position of uh, balance center of mass, but in a proprioceptive environment. We're going to change the environment. So, one foot. This is our, our base. This is where we start Balance University in this position. Remember I told you the entry point for other programs was on one foot and walking in a straight line. A lot of folks I've worked with can't do that. So we start here in an offset position. And then we build from there. Once you get comfortable here after a week, we'll add to it. Well, how do we add to it? Well, we shift our weight, right? We close our eyes. We put our hands over our head. We push from the back and come up. Right? Or we do a single leg balance reach. So there's tons, of, or we hula hoop. So there's tons of different things we can do to help increase the challenging environment, increase that proprioceptive environment. 1% of your time, there's 10,080 minutes in a week. 1% of that, it's about 220 minutes, 223 I think to be exact. So it's about 30 minutes, four times a week, or 15 minutes a day you'll reach that 1%. All right, and questions and answers. Hope I didn't bore you too much. So, uh, thank you very much. This has been years and years of, of, uh, of research and changing. You know, if you've been to any, any uh, lecture, it's changed. I guarantee you probably won't hear the same one twice. But next week, I wanna, next, There you go. Which is a big deal. Not being not having to use your hands. 
Yeah, that, that's a good yeah, sign. Perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Um, he said, uh, this is not the best thing to go for. And, and that's, it might not be planned. That's great. And that's a good move. Right. See how you increase that flexibility out of your chest? And also, you get some Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like your phone. Like your phone. Well, well, Thursday, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, Thursday, we're going to go through a class. You know, so if you want, check out. It's, it's mybalanceuniversity.com. You will see the Emeritus Health logo, but you're at the right logo. You're at the right place. And so you can go through and look a little bit about the company and about uh, who we are, who works for us. Uh, it's got most everyone on there. We've got a few that aren't uh, instructors. I think my wife will come along to this. So oh, yeah, that'd be great. That's correct, yes, sir, Thursday. Good, good. Well, uh, guys, it's a small business. Again, we self-published this book. I would not turn over the proprietary brand or rights to anyone. Um, you know, we had some choices to make business-wise. That's the business side of it. Uh, my thing is, is that I don't withhold knowledge from people who have a desire, if you know what I mean. Our classes are, are $10 a class. You know, people pay 40 bucks a month to go to the class. At the rate that we're going, uh, I told you I was going to talk to you a little bit about money real quick. In 2016, the United States incurred about $50 billion in fall-related injuries. Medicare bore two-thirds of those costs. That was in 2016. 10,000 Americans have been turned to 65 every day for the last decade. And it's going to continue, and it's projected to continue. We're projected to have over an $85 million uh, person population over the age of 65 by 2030. 85 million people. We've got a huge shortage in home health care staff right now. The statistics in home health care for falls are atrocious. There's an interview. It, it's you do not want to be there. Um, rehab is, is just as bad if you're released in, into an inpatient rehab. Like getting a hip replaced or a knee replaced. We've got some great statistics on the website for um, but it, you can like and follow us on Facebook. Uh, that's about the only thing I do, and it's under Emeritus Health. Also, a review on Google always goes a long, long way for little businesses like us. Oh, and there's our theme song. <laughs> so, I am, yes, sir. Yeah. Chris, how do you get from the website to this YouTube stuff? It's on there. Yeah, yes, sir. I wish I could. I wish I could access the. Oh, that's all right. From this website, you can get to the. It's it's that's it. Yes, sir. If you'll just scroll and you go when you click on the main page, there'll be a, a little thing that flashes up that'll ask you to subscribe to the newsletter. You can either choose to do that or right underneath it, it says no thanks. And then if you'll go to the Meredith's Health page, there's there's a button I believe on every page that says watch more videos. Go to the YouTube channel. You know, you can check that out. And then there's a video library listed on there. Every exercise that's in the book is in the video library. So we try to make it as easy as possible for everyone. So, 
Thank you for bearing with me. There's a sluggish start. But we got going. We built some momentum. <laughs> Think about the evolution of furniture, right? I mean, if you've ever been in the military, uh, there's no material or money lost on trying to make the seats comfortable in some of those Humvees or some of those big old trucks, man. It's you're sitting upright. Well, that's how furniture was, right? It was it wasn't for convenience. It was to have someone sit. You know, maybe they had to out of necessity. And so now, as we've advanced, man, it's gotten to the point where you, you get to where you don't want to sit down to where you don't want to stand up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, as this instructor said, you know, I'm not telling you to live in your nice fluffy couch. Just put a pillow behind you. Yes. So, and you sit back and you're not just Right. It forces that arch in your back. Yeah, that's a good good, uh, good tip there. So I've done that all along, but, and I notice it now. Yeah. Because the truck is too fast. Yeah, yeah, good advice. So, guys, I have, uh, if you'd like to sign up and register, I'll put you on the newsletter from here. I send out an email maybe once a month. Usually it's about once every two months. It's just where the next classes are starting. We have classes right now going in Estero being taught by Holly. And that's the graduates program. It's an ongoing balance class once a week. It's on at Mondays at 11. I teach right now online. We have a class through FGCU. That's at 9 a.m. every Friday morning that you can sign up for. I think their prices are a little bit different. Well, that means you have to Google it. You can, yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, you can, absolutely. Yeah, if you Google Emeritus Health, uh, we, uh, as of last week, we were number one. I don't know if we're still number one now. This stuff changes, you know, as, as much as the, the temperature changes. So, but, but if you do Emeritus Health, we're right there. Can't miss us. We'll take you right to the site. So hopefully we'll get some more classes going. But guys, books are $30 if you'd like one. Other than that, uh, thank you very much for being here. I certainly appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you Thursday. You get the exercises instead of uh, uh, coming to class. You have the exercises there available to do them when you like at your convenience. It also has a description under the exercise that explains how you're supposed to do it. You have a picture of the before and after so that you have it right there. And then also you can graph and document your progress so that you can see how well you're doing as you move through the 10 weeks. So no equipment needed. There may be, you may see equipment in there, but there's no equipment needed to do the program.